up on Tech News today, is Twitter ready for some football? Also, WhatsApp brings end-to-end -end encryption to more than 1 billion users. Addie Robertson from The Verge reveals her thoughts on the consumer version of the HTC Vive. And Facebook's object recognition is helping blind people see photos in their news feed for the first time. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1485, recorded Tuesday, April 5th. 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all of the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about all the technology news with people who love technology. That's right. I am Megan Maroney. And I am Jason Howells. Good to have you back, Megan. Thank you. I've been away for a week. I know. This has been kind of a crazy, crazy couple of days. It has, yeah. Uh, I was away. I was in D.C. visiting friends on assignment, mm. doing important government business. Sounds official. And seeing lots of monuments. And before that, you were gone. Yeah, I was in the snow, all that kind of stuff, enjoying the winter weather before it suddenly kicks into summer outside kind of the way it is today. But I got to say, the show just isn't the same when you're not here. So oh. it's good to have you back. Well, it's good to be back. And it's good to have both of us back. Because <laughs> it's know. hard to do it alone. It so. is really a little bit of a challenge doing it, doing it alone. So yes. um, awesome to have you here. All right. Well, let's get right to it. An unlikely player just entered the game of who has the right to stream NFL football online. Twitter just struck a deal with the NFL to stream Thursday night games. Joining us to talk about why is Will Remus from Slate. Welcome, Will. Hey, thanks for having me. So how much do your sources say that Twitter paid to stream the games? I'm told that it was less than 10 million, which sounds like not that much to stream 10 NFL games. Um, the reason for that is that Twitter agreed to simulcast the games and they're going to run mostly the same ads that are, that are uh, sold by the NFL's TV network broadcast partners. Only about 20% of the ads, I'm told, will be sold directly by Twitter. Uh, it's Twitter's flexibility that apparently allowed them to win the deal over more deep-pocketed players. Uh, Facebook was said all along to be bidding for these rights as well. There was word that Amazon might be in on it. Uh, Twitter ultimately won not by having the highest bid, but by uh, offering to go along with what the NFL and its broadcast partners wanted. So you also say that it had to do with the audience. Like, we always spend a lot of time talking about, like, we think Twitter's so big because we're journalists, and there's lots of journalists, there's lots of celebrities, uh, there's lots of politicians, but the average peop the average person isn't on Twitter as much as the, as the groups I just named. So what is it about this audience, do you think, that, that made it more appealing to the NFL? Yeah, it's probably not the sheer scale of the audience. If they were just going to try to reach the most people uh, via the streaming broadcast, they might have wanted to go for Facebook, which you know obviously has over 1.5 billion active users around the world. Twitter is much smaller; it only has about 300 million active users. That's been a, a source of uh, uh, consternation for the company and its investors for several years now. Um, but what Twitter does have is an audience whose uh, core users are young. They're in the demographic that the NFL is trying to reach here. I mean, the NFL has no problems reaching the average American household. Uh, what they want to do is reach those young people who have cut the cord, um, who are not watching on TV. Maybe they don't even have a TV. They do everything on their computers. They use social media a lot. That's also Twitter's core demographic. So that works out well. And in fact, the fact that Twitter is smaller than Facebook Facebook might even be advantage. I'm speculating here a little bit. But if you are NBC or CBS who have the rights to broadcast these games on network TV on Thursday nights, you might prefer that the NFL give those streaming rights to a social media site like Twitter that is not going to uh, poach your your core demographic for, for your telecast. Um, I, what I what I think of when I was kind of kind of reading through your story on this and kind of reading everybody's take on you know Twitter scores the NFL is just the sheer fact that it really seems like Facebook 
really wants to get in on this kind of game. I have to imagine this was kind of a slap in the face to them. They've got their sports stadium that they've tried to kind of get off the ground. I'm not even sure how successful that's been. I think what we're seeing just time and time again is that Twitter is just really good at the up to mi- up to the minute kind of updates on live events. And this is kind of proof of that. Do you think this kind of, sp- <laughs> I don't know, Does is, is this kind of a slap in the face for, for Facebook as far as that's concerned, do you think? Yeah, this is huge for Twitter because the one thing it still has over Facebook and really every other social media platform is that that real time thing. You know, it's Twitter's where you go to talk with people while you're watching a TV show or when a breaking news event is unfolding because you can have those conversations in real time. You don't have to you don't have to wait and see which posts get liked 100 times before they show up in your feed six hours later. Facebook's been pushing really hard on this. Mark Zuckerberg has said he sees Facebook being, uh, you know, not the majority, but but a lot of Facebook being live video a few years from now. But they have a little bit of a hard time with it. It's not as natural a fit because of the way Facebook's algorithm works. It just isn't geared toward having ongoing conversations or, or watching something that's happening in the moment. So I think you know I think the NFL uh, also appreciated that about Twitter, and and you know they have an existing partnership. They've been the NFL is probably the flagship partner for Twitter's Amplify program, which is a, a live video ad program um, where the NFL now shows highlights right after they happen in a game they appear on twitter and then somebody like mcdonald's or verizon sponsors those highlights it's been a huge huge revenue maker for twitter um there there are reports that uh those sponsors have paid over a million dollars just to promote those tweets so from what i understand you don't have to be logged into twitter you don't even have to be you don't even have to have a twitter account to to use this that's what we suspect um, is that part of what Twitter has been saying this whole time, that, that we're measuring their numbers wrong, that really um, the actual numbers of people logged in has nothing to do with how many people use Twitter on a daily basis? Yeah, that's that's exactly the argument that I that I make in the piece, which is that you know Twitter has wanted to say for years, look, you know the investors are are always upset every every time the quarterly earnings come out, and Twitter has not improved that number of monthly active users. There the groans, uh, you know, there's another round of groans, and and more people sell off the stock, and more people proclaim that Twitter is dying, and Twitter has been trying off and on, not consistently, but off and on, they've been trying to say, look, we are not just the people who log in every day and and read tweets and tweets, we we are also all those people who see tweets on, you know, sites across the web, on your uh, evening news telecast. Um, tweets can be syndicated. They, you can place ads in tweets that appear embedded on other websites. All those people are going to be able to watch the NFL stream on Twitter. Uh, we don't know exactly what the experience will look like, but there's a chance you'll even be able to embed the stream on some site other than Twitter. I don't know if that will be the case. Either way, logged out users are going to be able to watch, and they will watch, and that's going to highlight. It's going to it's going to sort of beat people over the head with the fact that Twitter does reach people other than those active users who tweet regularly. So this is 10 Thursday night games. Um, do you think that this is going to lead to something else, maybe streaming other content besides sports? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's the plan for Twitter. Of course, with, with Twitter, you know, they've they have had a lot of stops and starts on various product initiatives over the years, um, partly because they're under this they're sort of in constant crisis mode, um, uh, all stemming from the fact that they were that they went public and they were supposed to be the next Facebook and they haven't turned out to be that. And so there, there are these constant demands for them to grow now and grow fast. And so they at various times in their history, they've tried something, it doesn't really work, it, it kind of peters out, and then they try it again later. That said, I do think that if this works at all, it's going to be a big push for Twitter because it's it's two things. Again, it's, it's reaching those logged out users. It's maybe pulling new people into Twitter. You know, maybe you don't care to use Twitter on a regular basis, but you're a cord cutter. It's the best place to watch the NFL game on Thursday night. You see people talking about it in real time. Maybe you're moved to set up an account so you can jump into that conversation. And then it also, again, drives home the fact that Twitter is the place to have conversations about live events so i think if this works i think twitter will will be going after other live sporting events they'll be looking to be a streaming partner i wouldn't be surprised if they try to you know uh be the streaming partner for the academy awards i um i mean obviously hollywood is is especially uh averse to cord cutters and and hostile to them but uh, i think i think absolutely this is where a direction that twitter would like to go from now on Will, thank you so much for joining us. Will Arimis is a writer at Slate. He writes some excellent content. I am always emailing him to try to get him on the show. Uh, so I'm finally glad that you were, uh, you took the time, you, you had the time to come talk to us. Uh, tell people where you can, they can find all your work. Yeah, you can, you can find my work on Slate.com or I'm on Twitter at Will Arimis. Excellent. Thanks, thank thank you, Will. Thanks a lot. All right, so it used to be that if you wanted to engage in, let's say, secure chat communication, that is encrypted chat communication, 
Uh, you had to switch to a chat client developed specifically for that task, something like Telegram or Signal. Well, if you're one of the more than 1 billion users of Facebook's owned uh, WhatsApp, starting today, your communications are fully encrypted, and there's little need to jump ship to ensure your communication is protected, at least to the extent that encrypted communication is you know, safe from prying eyes. Uh, previously, one-to-one -one messages were encrypted. Now it's kind of like open to the entire deal. If you upgrade the app to the latest version, uh, your all your photos, videos, group text messages, uh, calls, the whole nine yards, it's all encrypted. Open Whisper Systems uh, has been rolling out support over the past year, and now with this latest update, uh, it's kind of bringing everybody on par. So I think this is really important because um, sure. places like Telegram and Signal, where you can get, uh, you can be fully encrypted. Uh, those are hard to use because nobody you know is on them. You know, mm -hmm. I have like Leo and uh, my one friend whose dad is super concerned with security and made her go on Telegram. Those are the only people mm -hmm. I can chat with uh, on Telegram. Signal's the same way, um, but WhatsApp has you know, billions of users, over a billion users. So uh, for people who care about encryption, this is really important. It also opens back up this debate of uh, what does that mean for law enforcement when, you know, when people can be fully encrypted and, and will, I mean, the, that argument that, that cryptographers and that many in the security uh, community and that we make that is full encryption better and safer for everyone, that's mm -hmm. still a question that a lot of law enforcement yeah. will ask and doesn't think so that it is for sure for sure this is a big signal uh from a, a, a big company right facebook is behind uh whatsapp and this is a very big kind of line in the sand um just i mean when you think about it like a team of 15 employees basically brought encryption to 1 billion users of an app that i mean is so widely used around the world um more so than sms text messaging in a lot of parts of the world it this is kind of what is used uh, by and large. Um, like I said, it does require the latest version. One thing that's very interesting about this is that once encryption is active through WhatsApp, even reverting to a previous version won't give you access to those that communication anymore. So they've really protected it as far as that's concerned. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, um, you know, I sometimes feel like I'm a little... Uh, lazy about how I talk about the government on the show. Like, I'm just like, oh, what are they doing? Especially with the whole Apple encryption debate. Like, I think, you know, we throw up, why why are they doing that? Don't they understand that, you know, that encryption is here and get used to it? And I, like I said, I spent the week in D.C. and, like, you really see how our government works. And, you know, just, it's, it's it, I was in awe a little bit of mm -hmm. it. And, like, they always say, like, with, you know, with terrorist attacks, we hear about the horrible stuff. We never hear about the the great stuff that our government is protecting us from. So right. I think I had a little bit of a change of heart uh, in a lot of this stuff. I mean, I still side with Apple in the encryption debate, but it is a big question. I mean, what happens? It we we have to answer this question. What happens when the government can't get into our phones? Then they really can't. Like it's a it's an unanswered question that still mm -hmm. needs to be answered, even though the Apple FBI debate is you know, is over for the short term. <laughs> yeah, short term being the, the operative word there. I'm sure there will be plenty of more opportunities for this to bubble back up, and uh, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. Uh, well, last week we talked about a new Twitter update that will allow you to add your own alt text to your post to make them more accessible to the blind. Now, I wondered about putting this responsibility on the user. That's what Twitter does. We talked about how Facebook was rumored to be using artificial intelligence to create the alt text for you. And today the company announced automatic alternative text or automatic alt text. The feature will use object recognition technology to create a description of a photo. So if you're using a screen reader on an iPhone or an iPad, uh, you will hear a list of items that a complex neural network has determined are in the photo. So it will say something, you know, it will you, a screen reader will say two people smiling outside or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just know you won't have to create it yourself. I love this. And, and what it really what really drives the point home is is watching that very you know top of article kind of video where you're seeing people who you know who are visu visually visually challenged and their reactions to kind of seeing through their mind's eye the photos in the photo stream when you take a look at a photo a, a news stream um, inside Facebook I mean I know my news stream is pretty much ninety percent pictures mm -hmm. you know that's pretty much what it's filled with and i have to imagine that's really difficult to to manage and to understand when you don't have any sort of context around it other than maybe the comments below or whatever it's still a little rudimentary like i love what this is and i love what it enables it actually kind of um makes me realize that 
text to speech right now like when you listen to kind of the examples that they play in the video very robotic very like duh, duh, you know kind of soulless mm -hmm. or whatever three comments mm -hmm. like but now you know obviously they you know are able to respond to it and and so that's better than nothing I'm really looking forward to kind of the further development of text-to-speech to really kind of make this even more human mm -hmm. and make it kind of seem like instead of a robot is reading you, you know, these short little taglines about a picture, a robot, you know, a, a person uh, is actually reading to you their description of what the, what you're looking at or what they see. Right. Uh, I love where this is headed. I do too. I mean, because when Twitter Twitter now does it too, but you have to enter it yourself. Right. And I just yeah. don't know how many people are going to take the time. Um, you know, a lot of us just don't think about the, the how technology is so inaccessible yeah. to so many people. I mean, you know, tag, that reminds me of tagging, where where it really put the kind of the pressure on the user to tag. And a lot of people did that. I could never get into it because I always felt like it was too much work to sit there on every, you know, spur of the moment post and then spend another minute like thinking of the tags that I'm going to put onto this and everything, putting all that work on the user. But you kind of don't need to do that anymore. I mean, Google's proving this, Facebook's proving this, that all this image recognition and all of this kind of these smarts behind the scenes of analyzing an image, you know, like Google Photos, for example, you can do a search of anything and their image recognition is so good that it can tell you that you're, you know, that this picture is of a lemur, you know, and it happens to be in your gigantic photo roll. Um, and when you get to that point, I mean, why put that onus on the user? It, I think this makes perfect sense. I think it's an yeah. excellent application of it. Yeah, and as, as long as we're talking about accessibility, the uh, I spent the week I spent with my friend who grew up, both his parents were hearing impaired, and uh, technology has just changed their lives completely because, sure. um, you know, texting, and he used to have to make phone calls for them, and, you know, you basically translate for them, and now he doesn't have to. I mean, there's so much communication that is now accessible mm -hmm. to the hearing impaired that wasn't. I mean, because we all communicate so much more with tech. So it's fascinating, and I love that it, that these companies are becoming more accessible. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of that. Uh, tech companies are using their size and their influence to make a statement about a North Carolina bill that passed last week preventing transgender people from using the bathroom or choosing a locker room that matches their identity as opposed to their birth gender. Uh, PayPal today actually announced that its plans to open a global operations center in Charlotte, North Carolina, have been scrapped, taking with it the potential of around 400 new jobs for the area. PayPal CEO Dan Schulman, uh, Schulman, uh stated that the law, quote, violates the values and principles that are at the core of PayPal's mission and culture. Um, and, you know, PayPal isn't alone here. Companies like Apple, Google, Twitter, and Facebook have all signed a letter by the Human Rights Campaign and Equality of North Carolina pushing for a repeal to HB2, uh, which is what has kind of instituted uh, this very <laughs> controversial uh, measure. Yeah, I mean, it's just tech jobs, tech companies mean, I mean, tech companies mean more jobs for a place. And, for um, sure. you know, I mean, they're, PayPal's, of course, uh, being called a bully for doing this. But I, I really believe that uh, this is kind of, this is a silly law. It's not about bathroom safety. I and mean, we can all be in the same bathroom. I think uh, we're okay with that. So I really, uh, I don't think it's bullying. I think it's standing up for what they feel is right and what the citizens feel is right, many of them. And it's not just tech companies too. The NBA, Bank of America, they've all sort of opposed House Bill 2. Yeah, I, I would I would agree that it's not necessarily about bullying. If you if you run a company, you want the you want the organization that you're running to hopefully at least reflect your values as a company. And if you're not standing up for those, then what do you then what are your values? Uh, it's very difficult to tell. Amazon actually held a pretty large kind of reveal about their plans to do this just last month. So this is a pretty big deal that they're kind of changing course. They're looking for other places, possibly Arizona, possibly Florida. And this is not the only time the tech companies have really kind of gotten in there and really kind of dug their feet in uh, to, to make change. Last month, Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff actually threatened to cancel a conference in Georgia, um, as well as boycott investments in the state um, if an anti-LGBT bill were to pass. And that actually affected change, that along with, you know, a number of other companies that kind of said the same thing. So uh, power, influence, and technology cannot be understated here. Obviously, they're able to move, you know, move in certain directions. I guess we, we don't really know yet whether it's going to affect any change in North Carolina. All right. Well, after the break, Addie Robertson from The Verge is here to tell us about her experience with the new HTC Vive. But first, let's take a minute to thank Blue Apron. 
I like to cook, but I am not very good at planning out what I'm going to make and then doing the shopping. And by the time I'm done with this show here, I never have time to do both. That's what mm -hmm. I love about Blue Apron. For less than $10 a meal, Blue Apron delivers all the fresh ingredients I need to create home-cooked meals. All I have to do is follow these step-by-step -step instructions. There are even photos for extra guidance. Each meal can be prepared in less than 40 minutes. No matter your dietary preferences, Blue Apron helps you discover and prepare dishes like roasted chicken and mixed mushrooms with crispy rosemary orange salad and chipotle pan sauce or Jamaican curry chili with chayote squash, collard greens, and pita croutons. All this right in your own kitchen. Cook with ingredients that you've never used before, like watermelon radishes, yuzu juice, and labna cheese. Recipes are between 500 and 700 calories per portion. They're delicious and good for you. And I recently got back from a vacation where I was a house guest to hold a friends. They were super busy with important government jobs that I don't understand at all. And as a way to thank them for putting up with me and one of my children and our mess, I am thinking of giving them the gift of Blue Apron. So if you are already a customer, think about giving it to someone you love or someone you've imposed on. <laughs> that way you'll be invited back. Blue Apron has gifts available in one, two, or four-week packages for both two-person and family plans. You can select the gift you'd like to give and schedule when you'd like to notify the recipient via an email with redemption instructions. That way they can choose when they would like the meals. Right now, you can get your first two meals free just by going to blueapron.com slash twit. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Today. All right, so last week undoubtedly was all about the Oculus Rift as far as VR discussion on the show is concerned. And now one week later, we have the release of its biggest rival, the HTC Vive. Joining us to talk all about her time spent with the consumer version of the Vive is Addie Robertson uh, from The Verge. How's it going, Addie? Uh, hi, great. It's great to have you here. So first things first, uh, first things first, right right off the top, your article is excellent, uh, fantastic layout, loved it, excellent read. Uh, you spent a lot of time both with the HTC Vive uh, Pre, which was the developer kit, and then now the consumer version that officially launched today to the public. Uh, what kind of big changes do you see from one to the other, or are there any? Hardware-wise, there are almost no changes. Uh, the big change is sort of the polish of Steam VR, the version of Steam that runs in VR, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still kind of rough and glitchy, but it functions. Uh, and there are a lot of new features, like you can see your desktop in it now, uh, or you can play any offline game in VR, or any non-VR game in what looks like a big screen in VR. <laughs> is that very satisfying? I have to... Uh, it's not wonder. hugely satisfying, okay. but All right. it's not bad. It's a stopgap, essentially. Um, what about comfort? Uh, is you know, anytime I, I see these these goggles, and I spent I did spend a little bit of time with the pre um, a few like probably a month ago, maybe five or ten minutes tops. Um, so I didn't get a long term sense of comfort. But uh, how does the uh, HTC uh, Vive stack up as far as comfort for long long term play? Uh, I don't find the Vive particularly comfortable, and most of the people that I've talked to don't either, especially compared to the Oculus Rift, which is really well-balanced. Um, the Vive is sort of front-heavy. It's mm -hmm. a heavy headset, and it kind of drags your face forward. Um, it's not bad. You can get used to it, but I would definitely get a, a little bit of a headache, and my neck actually would get a little bit stiff. For sure. So that's interesting. It's, it's prettier. It looks nicer, but it's not as comfortable. I, I also, I'm not as much of a fan of its design as I am of the Oculus Rift, uh, hardware-wise, but um, it's a matter of preference at this point. Yeah, I, I really think so. No matter what, you're wearing a huge thing on your face, and it's it's a sliding scale, I think, as far as what one person thinks is doable and the other person thinks is hideous. Um, what about setting up the space? Because I know there's, there's definitely a, a little bit more of a challenge around kind of setting up the HTC Vive uh, for all of the motion tracking. How is, how is that with the consumer version? Um, so again, it's pretty much the same as the last development kit. We timed it on my video and it took about 20 minutes for me to set up after I've probably set it up a few times now and I more or less know the drill. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest issue is just finding somewhere that's tall enough to put your base stations, uh, the laser towers. We managed to do it with uh, camera stands and a bookshelf they come with wall mounts that you can actually screw into the wall. Um, the biggest issue is really just being able to clear enough space. It's like imagine having a connect and then multiply that by several times. 
Right. So explain the front facing camera a little bit. Um, is that, does that make it like augmented reality at all? It does, but it makes it sort of augmented reality in the way that the Gear VR has augmented reality with the pass through camera. Um, so what it can do is basically show you either in sort of thumbnail image of what's happening when you go to the home screen. So you can, I don't know, look at your phone or pick up a glass of water, or it can actually show you a sort of stylized version of the rest of the world when you hit the home button or whenever you get to the outlines. Um, it's really useful. It's not augmented reality the way HoloLens is augmented reality, uh, but it sort of adds that connection to the outside world that the Vive has done a really good job of emphasizing. Yeah, it kind of gives you a little bit of a confidence pass through, let's say. Um, and it looks kind of futuristic. Uh, what happens in the case of like tracking kind of, I don't know, malfunction or whatever? Is there ever a, a point where things kind of get glitchy and it removes you out of the experience? So, you know, talking about immersion, that sort of thing. So the biggest problem for me would be people walking through my field of through the space sort of between me and the laser towers where occasionally you would sort of see your computer, your controller start slipping away a little bit. It was like it's floating out of your hands. <laughs> um, occasionally, it, your screen will just go completely blank gray when it loses tracking altogether. The problem is it's not always entirely clear what's causing this. Sometimes it's really obvious it's somebody just walking in front of you. Other times it seems like there's something that's blocking it, but it's not clear if it's that or if it's just a glitch. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty using the Vive. When it works well, it, it works really well, mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem like something that I fully understand all of the quirks of. Right. So what games have you played so far with it? My favorite's probably, it's not a game actually, it's uh, called Tilt Brush. It is a three-dimensional painting tool. I'm also a really big fan of a zombie horror survival shooter called The Brookhaven Experiment and a stealth game called Budget Cuts, both of which are just demos. They're very short, they're not full games but they use the Vive's controllers in really fun, interesting ways. And so have you played any of the games on both the Rift and the Vive? Um, I played their sort of sitting down games, and I've played things like Job Simulator, which is a very cross-platform. It's on uh, Sony's PlayStation VR. It's on the Vive. It's going to be on Oculus Touch. And they function very similarly. Right now, obviously, you only have one tracking camera with the Rift, and you can't move around all that much. But with two cameras, I've seen you get roughly the amount of space that I've gotten with the Vive. Hmm. All right, so the uh, the kind of broader question here, obviously, the HTC Vive is the more expensive uh, VR solution of the two that we're talking about today, $800. Is the Vive worth it? Is it worth it for only kind of VR, you know, crazy people like early adopters or do you think it's it's uh, poised for more of a broader push than that the cost question is a little bit open right now because we don't know how much the oculus touch controllers are going to cost uh, and i really true. think that they're going to be vital for the experience but that still probably won't make it more expensive than the vive i think that the vive is really useful for anyone who is very consciously interested in being a vr early adopter it's not really something that I would recommend to someone who's just sort of curious about VR and wants to check it out because it requires a lot of just time investment and willingness to deal with early hardware and early games. Mm -hmm. It's a bit more like a development kit than the Oculus Rift, which you can just plug in and it will almost always work. Well, I can't wait to get my hands on, on one. I'm sure we're going to get one here in the studio at some point. Behind me, we have the uh, the Oculus Rift, and I'm carving out some time. Tonight, after I'm done with all my shows, I'm going to go over there at least for a, a half an hour and, and get lost in it a little bit. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, loved your review, Addy, and thank you so much for coming on to kind of talk about your experience. Tell people where they can find all your work online. Uh, I am at TheVerge.com, uh, where YouTube.com slash TheVerge, and I am also at Twitter at uh, The Dextriarchy, which I think is on my lower third there. Yep, yep, we got it. Addie, thank you so much. Thanks, Addie. Thank you. All right, have a good night. All right, now we have an email from Chaz Holm, who writes, I was listening to Tech News Today, and there was talk of not being able to drive a Tesla in Texas due to the void of superchargers. <laughs> Wanted to send you the current map, since it's not as bad as you made it seem. Just bad in the western half and the extreme southern part of the state. Tesla has a thriving Texas ownership. 
So, of course, the Model 3 was uh, released last week, or ta it was released to order. If right. you wanted to order. order. If you wanted and it's to been decide, going nuts, by yeah. the way. If you yeah. wanted to pay $1,000 to have a car that you haven't Which seen, a lot of that you won't did. get until 2017. Mm -hmm. I know, people I know did. I mean... Because $1,000 is kind of still within that... You know, I mean, it's not like thousand a $1,000 is, is nothing, but it's still within that point of, eh, I could probably figure out a way to get $1,000 and, and feel like I'm signing up for something, you know, cutting edge uh, like the Tesla, so... Yeah, I um, it still blows my mind because I mean, yeah. if I want something, I, I want it right now. Like, I don't want. I don't know what kind of car I'm going to need in 2017. But if you're a fan of Tesla, you're used to waiting. You're used to yeah. expecting that you're not going mm -hmm. to get it right now. I suppose. Right, and anyone um, wanting to wait, pay thirty five thousand dollars for a Tesla has been waiting a long time. Uh, for sure, mm -hmm. for sure. And we'll have to keep waiting. Yeah, yeah, but it's a really good point when you look at the kind of the uh, the coverage map of the superchargers. I mean, they really do appear to be around most of the, you know, kind of significant portions of Texas. There's a lot of open space on that western area, so I guess you, it would be a lot to expect that the superchargers would be out in the middle of, of you know, the desert or whatever. I've driven that road. Uh, I am from Texas, and there's not a lot else yeah. there. Yeah. But I bet there will be more chargers. I mean, that's, again, who knows that's how many chargers there's going to be. Right, absolutely. So. All right, TNT's fan of the day is Jay Haynes NZ on Twitter, who sent us this picture of three separate machines. I love it when we get like, here's how many machines I use while I watch the show, two of which are devoted to Twit, and of course, one devoted to TNT. He said, how I watch TNT from New Zealand. Keep up the hard work, Megan and Jason. It is incredibly hard work. Much easier now that Megan is back, though. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Uh, show us how you watch or listen to TNT. We love getting these from you. Just record a video, take a picture of yourself or your setup, post it to Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. All you got to do is use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we will find it, or so we hope. So we have almost reached the triumvirate of things we love to talk about on this uh -huh, show. Okay. Uh, Twitter, uh -huh, VR, yes. and the third, of course, robot cars. <laughs> Can't get through a car with a show without talking about self-driving cars. Tech Insider True. dug into the latest self-driving car report from Google and discovered a nice collection of the most bizarre things that robot cars have had to deal with since they've been on the road. Uh, and unlike humans who just shake their heads or take a picture and post it on Twitter when they see a man jump out in front of their car in his underwear... The autonomous cars learn from this bizarre world, and they adapt. So some of the strangest things that happened included three cars in a row going the wrong way on an intersection, a woman in an electric wheelchair chasing a duck with a broom in the middle of the road. That's this one that we're looking That's at right woman. now, which I love. It looks so, because you can see, it's like, oh, I think I can go now. No, wait a minute. No. The duck and the wheelchair are coming back. I've got, I guess I got to. Not stay a day here. goes by when I don't see I know, a woman really in an electric seriously. wheelchair chair with a broom and a duck. <laughs> There's also a guy rolling on the hood of the car just for fun. Yeah, I, you know, at the same time, this is South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. This is Austin, Texas, during South by Southwest. So you've got this high concentration, at least if if it's for the technology kind of portion of uh, South by Southwest, a high con con uh, concentration of nerdy, geeky, wild people. They're there to have a good time, but they also know a lot about technology, so it's probably pretty obvious to a lot of these people that this is a Google autonomous car, and they're hamming it up. You know, it's you saw a lot of this with uh, Street View. Mm -hmm. People got wise to what a Street View car looked like, and anytime they saw it, they knew to do something because they knew it would make it online at some point. But I love, I love kind of the real-time analysis of this stuff. Seeing it in action just kind of blows my mind. Yeah, and I I want robot cars to know all these things, to learn all the weird sure. things, so that they're ready for them when when leap I frog. have mine. When 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 twenty people leapfrog mm -hmm. out in front of the car, I want to know that the car's going to stop. Um, they say uh, here in in kind of the talk during the South by Southwest presentation where they showed off some of this stuff. Anomaly protection is kind of the scenario of like let's say the leapfrog or whatever, or where, the woman with a broom in the where it's not like it's not like duck. they're programming specifically for woman in wheelchair chases duck with broom, <laughs> but rather, you know, it's more of like a generalization of what it's seeing and what does it do there. And it's almost like it stuns it into not moving because mm -hmm. it just can't figure this out. And that's probably the safe thing for it to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. All <gasps> right. You did it. We did we it. We did it. Yeah, we did it. Uh, tomorrow's guest will be Rich Demuro, old friend from CNET. He's now a tech reporter for KTLA TV. He's been there for quite a while, so it's going to be great to get Rich on the show tomorrow. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific.
7 p.m. Eastern and 12 a.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can always be a part of the show by emailing us your thoughts and opinions about what we talk about. That's TNT at twit.tv. You can also leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. And you can find the show on Twitter. We are at Tech News Today TV. The best way to get our show and to be first to get our show is to subscribe. First in line. First in line. You can be first at mm -hmm. twit.tv slash TNT. You can subscribe all the ways. You can listen. You can watch. Whatever podcast catcher you use, you can find it there. You can also subscribe to our Twit newsletter. That's at twit.tv slash newsletter. And find us on Facebook. We are facebook.com slash technewstoday. And I am on Twitter at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Anthony Nielsen, and all the folks who help us produce this show every single day and our amazing audience that happens to be in studio <laughs> right behind us. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Woo! Welcome back! Yay!